The, the title of this message is That Thorn That Will Not Leave. But um, this message is pro hopefully going to be a very encouraging message. And uh, I know it was very enlightening to me. There were some things that I didn't necessarily see. And uh, the Lord really opened it up to me, to my uh, understanding. But the passage of Scripture that the title is coming from is in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. In fact, I think last week, it was in maybe your Wednesday message or something, you had covered uh, some of this stuff here. <clears throat> All right, and it, uh, in verse 7, it says, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. It could also be translated to strike me. Lest I should be exalted above measure, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my grace is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. All right. There's all kinds of different things that come into a person's life. And here, Paul's referring to this as a thorn. It's, it's more of a figurative reference. He gets real specific when he says that a messenger of Satan was sent against him to buffet him. Um, I know Matt's taught on that particular word, buffet, and uh, whatever the case may be, it's, it's something very powerful coming against Paul. And it was through a messenger who was obviously either a fallen angel, or it was maybe one of the Nephilim spirits, a demon spirit, whatever it was, it was a force that was from the kingdom of darkness that was sent specifically on assignment to Paul. And there's always going to be this kind of struggle. I like to refer to it also as a struggle. We're not talking about just a little struggle. We're not talking about a little bit of frustration. We're talking about something that is of great magnitude. For a messenger of Satan to come against somebody. Somebody of great power and influence in the church. And these thorns are going to beat us down. They're going to beat our faith down. And it has the ability to absolutely break us. It has the ability to break our faith. I had preached another message. I, I think it was one of the first messages I had preached. I think it was the first. No, it wasn't the first. But anyway, uh, and it was, uh, it was a message about your faith. How settled is your faith? And this kind of goes along the same lines on this, this thought right here. They'll beat us down in our faith. They'll potentially break us. They could even break our faith. And people ask why when they go through these really massive, great struggles. They ask, why is there always a struggle? It's always the question, why? Why is there always a thorn? Where's there always got to be? There's always something. There's always got to be something. Everything was going fine. I just got over the last problem, the, the last issue. And then now this. Why? Why is there pain? Why is there suffering? Why is there premature deaths? Why do little babies die before they're even born? Why do these kinds of things happen? There's disease, there's physical pain. For you, it might be pain. It might be physical pain. It might be irritations, like your spouse. It might be your sister. It might be your brother. It might be your children. It might be something that's going on with, uh, with your neighbors. Whatever the case, it could be the cause of a thorn, a frustration, something of great magnitude that just absolutely Put you against the wall. Absolutely strikes you in the face or in the gut. Why, God? We ask things like, why and how long? How long am I going to have to endure this? How long am I going to have to go through this? It could be the loss of a job. This church saw a lot of people who lost jobs. And <clears throat> although when the industry took its downturn in the oil field, I was affected by the oil field and, and the way it can affect your job, but it was long before the downturn. I used to be a safety coach and I would travel from rig to rig within my company and I would help prepare them to go come out of the shipyard and go out into the field for the first time, help them to understand how to use the safety programs. 
And uh, I thought I was doing a pretty good job. My supervisor had given me a really great evaluation. Uh, there were some honorable things that had happened for me. I, I really was like, wow, I didn't see what was coming. But my supervisor even recommended me for, uh, for a special issue in, in our company magazine, just about me and about why I'm being so successful and why things are going so great. And I mean, I had just done, been uh, featured in one of these articles in this magazine. And then it wasn't long after that, I think it was maybe a few months later, bam, I mean that thorn. I'm talking about that struggle. I'm talking about the one that came out of nowhere. You just, I didn't see it coming. My supervisor was getting promoted. He's a Norwegian. For me, that was a good thing. The guy that was taking his place was an American. For me, that was not a good thing. He had other guys that he wanted to get into my position and other like positions. There were four of us. And it took me a long time to come to this understanding. It doesn't really even matter. I was asking why, why God, why? I was demoted from a safety coach, which is the equivalent of a crane operator's pay. And I was brought all the way down to a roustabout, which is the entry level position. It was almost a 50% pay cut. I had built my life around the pay that I was already in. It wasn't just a struggle financial, but it was demeaning. <laughs> It actually attacked me in my pride, in the, the way that I carried myself, the way that I saw myself in light of my coworkers. It was, uh, it was really, really tough. And it was in the, the time after that followed when I was scrubbing and mopping the decks with a partner that God gave me the opportunity to pursue him in a way that I had not in a very long time. It was just me and this guy, and most of the time we weren't even talking to each other. I was able to pray. I was able to cry out to God. I was able to let my heart cry out to him and really commune with him, really communicate and ask him, Why, God, how long am I going to be on this deck, mopping this deck and scrubbing and, and chasing that headache ball and that hook, chasing the crane around all over the place? I just could not understand why, why this happened to me. And at the end of the message, we're going to get to a certain point where why is not really a question that we need to know the answer to. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to tell you that I'm not going to give you some answers here tonight. What I believe could be potential possible answers. But my answers and what I believe God may have given me in that point of the message may not be the answer for you. It may not be what God would say, this is why. But the fact of the matter is, the question isn't why, the question is what? What do you want me to do now? Because I'm here and I can't change it. Amen. It's out of my control. And so this touches everybody. This touches me, it touches you. It doesn't matter how old you are. You can be the younger per youngest person in this room, it doesn't matter. Because if you cannot relate right now, you will relate one day. That's right. The day is gonna come where you're going to relate. And you're going to need something bigger than you, something stronger, That's something right. more powerful, something wiser, something that can bring you to where God wants to bring you to. And so we have to become dependent upon God. So we ask those kinds of questions, and we ask not just why and how long, but do you even care? Do you even see me? Do you even see what's going on, God? Because I can tell you one thing for sure. I asked that question. In my situation, I asked that question. And that's exactly what I felt, and that's what I meant when I said it. All will soon experience a thorn to test their faith. It may be today, it may be tomorrow. It may not be, but eventually you will. Job chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. In that passage, it shows that there were fallen angels that went before God. And the Bible says, after the fallen angels went before God, Satan came right up with him. That was his boys, and he wanted to control the conversation. And the conversation went something like this. God says, oh, okay, what you been doing, Satan? God asked him, what you been doing? He said, oh, I've been going about the earth to and fro. He didn't say exactly what he was really doing. He just said he was going about the earth. But what are you doing? And God said, have you considered my servant, Job? Have you considered him? 
And Satan said, well, it's not even an issue. It's not even a point to be reckoned with because it doesn't matter. I mean, you've got a hedge built around him. There's no way I can get to him. I can't test his faith. I can't tempt him. I can't do anything of any great magnitude in his life because you've got him surrounded with a hedge of protection, with angels all around him. And there's no way that I could really test him. So his love for you, it's almost like it's for nothing because it's not tested. It's not being uh, put on the line. He has nothing to lose and he has everything to gain. And so the circumstances changed and God gave him permission. And look at what God did to Job. He lost his whole family. He lost his livestock, his, his income. He lost his home. He lost everything. It wasn't only Job. We can go on into the New Testament and we can see where the disciples, where they were tested. They were tested in a capacity like, like was unimaginable. The same devil, the same Satan that appeared before God concerning Job is the same Satan that appeared before God concerning Peter. In fact, Jesus told Peter, you're going to deny me, but don't worry because I've already prayed for you. The devil wants to sift you as wheat, but I prayed for you. And you know, we put a lot of focus on Peter because we know a more full story. But we don't think about the other disciples. Do you realize that in Mark chapter 14, verse 27, he actually tells them all, he says, all of you are going to be offended. Now, we need to understand what that word offended means. It means to be entrapped. It means to be tripped up. It means to potentially go into apostasy. He said that to all the apostles. And it was right there, it was right there in the same context. This is just another parallel uh, passage of the same account. This one is in Mark, where the other one before it was Luke. Mark uh, 14, 27. Is it right? Okay. So, Judas was in the 12. He was in that group. And what's interesting there is uh, in Luke 22, 3, the first uh, scripture reference was Luke twenty two thirty one, 31, where he tells Peter that he's going to sift him. But several verses earlier, it was in verse 3, where he tells Judas, go ahead and do what you got to do. The devil actually entered into Judas. Satan himself entered into Judas. And he was like, go ahead and do what you have to do. But he was in that group. He was, he was in one of the ones he actually got entrapped. He actually did fall to apostasy. But the other 11 did not. The other 11 did not. John 13, 27. Satan entered into him. And then Jesus said unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. Okay. Yeah. So, it's something to test our faith. It's something to test how solid and how settled we are in God. People don't always think about it, but we talk about faith, but it's, it's a matter of faith in what? What is your faith in? The question is, what does it lean on? We're putting faith and we're putting trust in a variety of different things to some extent and some degree. But when it comes to our salvation, when it comes to being able to get up another day, the question is, what is our faith being placed upon? The weight of our faith must rest in the cross of Jesus and the eternal Son of God. Faith in anything else is dead weight. Putting our faith and resting it on anything else. When Jesus died on the cross, before he died, his last words were, it is finished. No other work must be done in addition to the finished work of Christ. That alone saves us apart from righteous works. Titus 3, 5 tells us that. That there's no other works that need to be done for us to be saved. Colossians 2, 6 says, just as you first received him, walk in him. That simply tells us that he's able to keep us after we become saved. Keeping our faith in Him keeps us. Amen. So, there's some things that we need to know while waiting. 
how does one endure a struggle? Because Paul had a thorn in him and he couldn't get rid of it. He prayed three times and the answer was no, it's going to stay every single time. And he was just stuck with it. He was stuck with that. He was stuck to an extent. He was stuck while he was here on earth. But after that, everything was going to change. And the thing is, while Paul was waiting, how was he to endure the struggle? We have to know. There are some things that we have to know. And the first point, while waiting, something we need to know how to endure the struggle. We need to know that God is more interested in our growth than our getting. God is more interested. God is more interested in our growth than our getting. For Paul, it was that God was more interested in his growth than his getting rid of that thorn, that messenger. For some of you, it may be that God's more interested in your growth than actually you getting something that you're waiting on. For me, for four, look, it was almost four years. I went from a position that was a really great position, and I went down to a roustabout position, scrubbing decks, decks mopping the floor. I'm telling you what. I thought I was dreaming at night that I would wake up one day and meet my wife and she'd be scrubbing in front of me in the kitchen and I'd be mopping behind her. I was doing it so much. It was like, it was all I could think. But God had something better and I had to accept it. I had to accept this is the struggle that I'm stuck with. Adjust your, uh, your budget. <laughs> Build it around the new pay. Make adjustments and deal with it. And put your faith in me and just trust me. And don't waste an opportune time. I don't even understand why through this downturn in the oil industry, I'm now a storekeeper. I'm now in a position that is, is it's kind of up there, definitely further up. And uh, the pay is much better. And God's blessed me. And I don't understand why I haven't been affected by it. I'm seeing guys all around me. Guys, the guy that trained me for the storekeeper job, he's getting laid off. His uh, rig that he's on. This is very recent, like uh, the last time I was out, about th almost uh, three weeks ago, they all learned at this rig that they're all getting laid off. And so now he's looking for another job. He's the one who trained me. I don't understand it. <laughs> it's definitely beyond my comprehension. It's definitely humbling. It should be humbling, and it is for me. Waiting is not in style today. And patience has never been a fruit of the flesh. Galatians 5.22 says it's a fruit of the Spirit. God wants to grow sons and daughters. Waiting takes time and it is essential to our growth. We have to be willing to wait on God. We have to be willing to be patient. I like what Henry Ward Beecher said about patience. Henry Ward Beecher said, There is no such thing as preaching patience into people. Unless the sermon is so long that they have to practice it while they hear it. <laughs> now, I think I have the ability to accomplish that, but I think there's someone here who can do much better. Than that. <laughs> I'm just going to leave that there. Yeah. I couldn't resist. I couldn't resist. <laughs> God is more interested in our growth. And the thing is, David, the psalmist, he understood a lot about waiting. In fact, when you look at his psalms and the ones that he wrote, when you read over, many of them are filled with prayers about waiting. Not help me to wait, but no, as I'm waiting. He's saying, I am waiting. Psalms 25.3. All right, Manuel, let's see how quick you are. Psalms 25.3 says, In waiting on God indeed, let no one be ashamed. He's saying, God, don't let me be ashamed while I'm waiting on you. <clears throat> Psalms 25.5. Waiting on God in the scripture, it shows that it has the potential to lead us into his truth and to teach us. Psalms 25, 21, waiting on God causes integrity and uprightness to preserve you. Psalms 27, 14, waiting on God grows courage and strength. Psalms 52, 9, says, David says, wait on his name for it is good. And let's face it, where else would we go anyway? Right. Yeah. Who else is going to help us? Right. What are we going to do if we're not going to wait? Like, what are we in our own strength? What would I have done about that job scenario? What would I have done in my own strength? Once I found out the dynamics of how everything went down, I foolishly pursued it. I wanted to know. I just had to know. It, 
didn't help me, I can tell you that. <laughs> it did not help not one iota. David says in Psalms 59, 9, waiting on God places you under His defense. In Psalm 62, 5 through 7, waiting silently for God alone. It has the ability to cause us to see Him as a rock of strength and a refuge of salvation. You can't go wrong. You, you just cannot be too patient. You got to get that. Uh, it's something that we all need to learn. But the, the thing is, the only way, according to what uh, this Henry Ward Beecher was saying, is the only way to get patience is to just get out there, get in the hustle and the bustle of the world. And while waiting, let God, let Him instill it in you. It's a fruit of the Spirit. The second thing that we need to know while, while we're patiently waiting and, and enduring the struggle is that we need to know how the de devil operates. We need to know how the devil operates. Genesis 3.1. In Genesis 3.1, the serpent is imposing his lies and his confusion. And he comes to Eve with a question. That's not a good way to start a conversation in most cases. He comes and he says, has God said you shall not eat of every tree? And so in Genesis 3, 2 and 3, she says, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it lest you die. It was, it was quite obvious what the devil was doing. He was asking the wrong question. He was trying to confuse the command. They were not to eat of only one tree. He asked, were, are you, did God not say that you're not to eat of any of the trees in the garden? No, he said don't eat from this one tree. You could eat from all of them except for one. He done twisted and turned the whole situation around in her mind. He was working on a mass deception. Satan was working on the, the devil. I'm talking about that slithery, slimy snake before he lost his legs. He was working on something. And in that conversation, the way Eve responded, he was able to work his way around her to where she was going to be deceived. This mass deception, Satan reduced God's command to a question and a lie. And in Eve's mind, she gave to it. After she quoted word for word verbatim, she quoted the command that God gave and she was still deceived. Genesis 3, 4. Satan tells her, surely you will not die. Surely you won't die. Satan planted doubt in Eve's mind about what? About the consequence of the command. The command was... And God had already told it to Adam in Genesis 2, 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eat thereof, you shall surely die. You shall surely die. What did Satan say? Surely you won't die. What did God say? Surely you will die. What did Satan say? Surely you won't die. It was so blatant. She already quoted it to him. Lest I die. Lest we die. And he didn't say lest you die. He said surely you will die. This was before there was a magnetic pull when temptation came. There was no magnetic pull on Eve. I'm going to get a little deeper into that magnetic concept. The Lord gave me something. He put something in my mind. And, and I, I never really saw sin or, or should I say temptation. It's not sin so much as it's temptation. Satan planted doubt in Eve's mind about the consequences of the command. In Genesis 3, 5, he says that their eyes will be opened. That's what the devil tells her. Your eyes will be opened and you will become as gods. You will know good and evil. Now, here in his mass deception, he's, he's still working on something. He's still shaping it. He's trying to get that... He's trying to get that fence into a fist into a really good clinch so he could just launch it and, and just punch her right in the gut with this temptation. Satan promised an advantage. He promised a gain to disobeying God. 
He promised it. There it is right there in Genesis 3, 5. He says, number one, your eyes are going to be open. He said, number two, you're going to be as gods. And then number three, you're going to know good and evil. And that's his way of, uh, his premise for saying that you're going to become gods. Because if you know good and evil, you're like a god. Satan promised this advantage. And in doing so, he was teaching Eve to trust the devil rather than to believe God. There is never any gain to disobeying God. The advantage was all in Satan's, fa Satan's favor. Eve would soon become the loser. It's important for us to understand. What was the point? The point was know how the devil operates. Yeah, I moved on to the next one. <laughs> we have to know how the devil operates. And if you go through the Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation, you'll see the many fold functions. I mean, there are so many, uh, just a variety of functions of what the devil does. He lies, he deceives, he tempts, he provokes, he hinders, he disputes, he contends, he casts, he tests, he tricks, he ensnares, he enters, he possesses, he binds, he chains, he afflicts, he punishes, he weakens, he imprisons, he torments, he shakes, he shook the nations, he condemns, he slaughters, he buffets. Or he strikes, he walks, he seeks, he roars, he devours, <clears throat> he steals, he kills, he destroys, he murders, and he fills with lies. But the last one is the most important. He flees. Mm -hmm. Despite all the damage that he does, we have been given power to cause damage to him. Mm -hmm. Despite the damage that he does to us, Despite the damage he's done out there, we have been given the power to submit to God, resist the devil, and put him on the run to where he has to flee. Praise God. In the Greek, the word flee in that scripture, which I don't have the reference, but where he says resist the devil, it means to run away, to escape, to vanish, to seek safety by flight. I like Noah Webster. You know I like Noah Webster. I brought him out in another message. Noah Webster talks about fleeing. And he talks about it just simply being to depart, to leave, to hasten away. Make haste, devil, and go in the name of Jesus. He has no place. He has no authority. If we're submitted to the will of God, we're submitted to the cross of Jesus. If we're walking in the Spirit, and that's the only way to walk in the Spirit, is if we've been baptized into Christ. And we know that, and we know about that. It's important to know that. We don't just simply need to know how the devil operates, but we also need to know how the human heart operates. It's important. While you're waiting on God and you're enduring your struggle, while you're enduring this storm, whatever it may be, you need to know, you need to know how the human heart operates. That's the third thing that we need to know. 1 Timothy 2.4 talks about how the woman being deceived was in transgression. Although she was deceived, she was blindsided, so to speak. You can word it any kind of way that you want. The, although Eve was deceived, she was still in transgression. Sin injected and infected into her bloodline. What did Eve do? She saw. She was pleased. Then she desired it. She touched it, she took it, she ate it, and then she gave it. And what did he do? Ate it. He ate it. James 1, 14 through 15. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. How many times have our heart's desires led us into the same old temptation? The fact of the matter is, is we cannot be tempted of anything we don't already want. He can attempt to tempt. But if it's not something you like, there's no pull. There's no draw. The temptation is a useless one. 
And so that's what causes us to where we can't just put it all on Satan. <laughs> Eve could not put it all on that serpent that day because there was something inside of her where when she actually looked and she saw, and in her mind and in her heart, it was good. It was pleasant to the eyes. And so she had already begun to commit in her heart. She had already begun to sin inside. <laughs> Jeremiah 17, 9 through 10 says, The heart is deceitful and des desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? I've heard, a lot, I've heard people say this. <laughs> Some people will say, talking about a person that they care about, a person that's close to them, they're trying to take up form or whatever. I know what's in his heart. I know what's in her heart. With confidence. They are a good person. They love God. And I'm here to tell you today, that only God knows That's what's right. in Amen. His heart or her heart, Amen. my heart or your heart. That's right. We need to seek God before making a move. When I was in that job, you, I cannot even begin to tell you how many times it passed across my mind because that's when the industry was at its height, at its peak in this era of the oil field. I can't even begin to tell you how many times it crossed my mind to leave and to go somewhere else in safety doing what I was doing. But I had to just stay where I was. There was still something inside of me that told me, no, you need to stay where you are. Endure. Endure. Stay with it. And a lot of those companies, a lot of those companies have met much fewer rigs than what we have right now. Many of the, the, the rigs that are with those companies are terminated, cold stacked. They've already been brought to the dock and they'll never be used again. There was another situation while I was aroused about after that first thorn. There was another struggle that came at me and I was started to train for this storekeeper position. The one of which this guy I told you about, the one who trained me. He's a Christian man. He's a godly man. I have a lot of respect for him. And God really used him greatly just simply to give me the knowledge that I needed for the job. And to help train me up. And while I was going through that, I was rebuilding a good working relationship with the captain, the OIM on that rig. And when I say rebuilding is because it was like just, it was very much up and down with him. It was very difficult to maintain a solid working relationship with him. And by the grace of God, uh, things got turned around. I started working extra shifts offshore. I would look at it, work an extra week when there was an opportunity to do it. And he saw that like I was helping my company. Not that I was helping my wallet. So God turned that around and he used it in my favor. It was, it was at a point one day he told me, he said, so you're going to be a lifetime roustabout, aren't you? I was like, well, that's not my goal. And he was like, well, as far as I'm concerned, you are. And so God took that kind of a working relationship wow. And turn the whole thing around. And, yeah, I noticed you've been working over a lot. You've been working these extra weeks. You're helping the company out, you know. And I was like, hey, praise God, yeah. I guess I am helping the company out. And the Lord made a way. And he said, so you've been training. I know you've been uh, working toward uh, getting this storekeeper job. The big deal with him was he wanted me to be a crane operator. I don't know why. He had it in his mind and in his head. I was going to be a crane operator. I used to work at the Mr. Charlie Rigg Museum in Morgan City. I did some crane operating there. It was absolutely nothing of the likes of working offshore, doing dynamic lifts from a boat that's rocking all around. This is not at all comparable. It, it doesn't even deserve to be mentioned. I, I, don't, I didn't deserve to be called a crane operator, to be honest. <coughs> so... He just had it in his mind that that's what I was going to do. Somehow it was in his mind. And so I knew that that's not what I wanted to do. And that's not definitely not something God was calling me to do. And so that's when he, uh, I, I don't know if I should say he turned against me or whatever, but the whole situation turned against me. And so he got turned around the other way. He's for me. He's pulling for me. He's encouraging me. He's promising me. <laughs> He's putting all these big promises out there. You're going to be the next guy. You're, going to, you're the next one. When that storekeeper spot opens up, you're the next one. The storekeeper spot opens up. 
what do you think I felt on the inside? I had been working toward this for a long time. And there was another guy who was a storekeeper on that rig, and he was about to leave to go to another. He was transferring to a drill ship. And he went to the captain. He went to the OIM. Like he sought him out, and he said, whatever you do, do not let Aaron Lusto get that job. He is not the man for that job. I have been working with him, and I see, and he has shown me nothing. But this guy, this guy is good for the job. And I mean, he was chewing on his ear until he got him swayed. And so guess who didn't get the job? That was about two and a half years into my roustabout career. And uh, it went on to be four years. And so... One of the guys, one of the guys that was at this drilling rig that just got cold stacked was the one who got the job. Now let's look at this. That's where I would be right now. That's where I would be. I would be a laid off son of a gun. <laughs> That's what I would be. I would be looking for another job. Now that doesn't mean that it can't happen. And I, I keep that in my heart and in my mind knowing the possibilities. It could happen next month, next hitch. I might go out there and find out. But we have to trust God and we have to know that he is in control. We have to just simply keep it where it belongs. Only God knows, and we have to always seek God before making a move. So that's where I got off track. Rather than leaving that job and leaving that roustabout position, I stayed where I was, and here I am today still in a good place before God. Adam and Eve covered. They tried to cover a, cover a ruined relationship in fig leaves of shame, and it could not restore that relationship. They were hiding in the garden. A couple of scenes later, God's walking in the cool of the day. He's calling out to Adam and Eve, wanting to know where they're at. And they're hiding behind trees with their fig leaves of shame. And God, it wasn't good enough. God had to provide a sacrifice. God had to provide skins to cover them. God had to give them something that was more concrete. Something that could efficiently do the job. It's always going to be about the sacrifice. No matter what we're going through, no matter what the struggle and the thorn is, it's always going to be about His sacrifice. Amen. We have got to stay connected with His sacrifice. If you've fallen away and you're just coming back, if you're falling away right now as I'm sharing this with you, you need to know that it's never too late. It's never too late as long as you're alive and you're on this earth in this life. It's not too late. And if you put your faith back in the sacrifice and understand that that's where you shifted, that is where you started to fall. It wasn't when the struggle came. It wasn't when the thorn came. It wasn't when you didn't get your way. It wasn't when, it was not when, that massive freight train, that was more like what happened to Job. It was more like a freight train that came against him. Paul, I, I'm kind of thinking it was probably something like a freight train for him too to have the messenger of Satan working on him. I can't say that I had a freight train hit me. It felt like it in my heart, but that's not really what hit me that day whenever I had to take the demotion. The fourth thing we need to know while we're enduring the struggle, while we're enduring the thorn, we need to know that the, we need to know the danger of wide-eyed disobedience I don't know about Eve in this point I don't know that I could really say that it was wide eyed for her she sure did quote this uh, command quite well and either <clears throat> some scholars believe that um, it was not fully recorded that Moses whenever he wrote the book of Genesis that it was not fully recorded when the command was given to Adam because Adam didn't say anything about not touching the fruit but Eve said don't even touch it if you'll notice what she said when she quoted the command she said we're not to even touch it I don't think she lied she wasn't lying she wasn't adding to God's word that's not what it's about 
It's more that either it just wasn't recorded and Moses said, look, it's not here, it's here, and so, okay. But the fact of the matter is, she was deceived. She knew the command. Adam was not deceived. Not in any fashion or form. And 1 Timothy 2.14 says that. It says, and Adam was not deceived. It didn't say anything about Eve, so I'm thinking, yep. Yeah. And we know that Eve was. The fact of the matter is about Adam is he did not believe God in his command. He did not believe it. Maybe he did in the beginning, but at some point he stopped believing. He stopped believing that there was a true consequence. He stopped believing that there truly, it truly was for his best. We have to realize this because when these struggles come and when these thorns are on us, we are going to be tempted to do these things, to disobey His command, to turn away from what we know, to shift our faith from the cross, to put our faith and our trust in something else. It would have been so easy for me to put my trust in going to some other company and find a job that can give me better pay. But for me, I can't say for you what it would be, but for me in that context of that day and what I was going through, I needed to just stay where I was so God could teach me something and He could deepen my relationship with Him so I could learn more about how to pray while I'm scrubbing and mopping decks on a rig. Come on, brother. I did learn, too. I got pretty good at it. Amen. <laughs> If we go home tonight and we go purchase us a scrub, brush, and a mop and get us a bucket, we could definitely make that kitchen floor shine. <laughs> Adam was not deceived. And the fact is, he did not believe God. His duty in Genesis 2.15 was to dress and keep the garden. He was just simply to dress and keep the garden. That's all his duty was. All Adam had to do was dress and keep. Before Adam was created, the Bible says, the Scripture says in Genesis that God said... That there was no one to till the garden. There was no one to till the ground. That was his job. He was then created so he could dress and keep. To dress is to labor and work. I'm talking about tilling some ground. Genesis says there was no man until prior to Adam's creation. There was no one there, no man there that could do it. To keep is to guard, to watch, to ward, as in to ward off to protect, and to save life. Adam could have saved Eve's life. He could have saved her from that death, from eating of the tree. We don't have any proof that Adam was there when the conversation went down with the serpent. There could have been a gap there. I'm not sure, because if you read the text, Genesis 3, 5 through 6, there very well could have been a gap between when the serpent had the conversation with Eve, and when Eve is at the tree and she sees that it's good. He could have been having the conversation right there in front of the tree. Okay, I don't know. The Bible doesn't give us specifics about that. But one thing that I do know, one thing that we can be sure of, is that in Genesis 3, 6, it says, She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Other versions say she gave it to her husband who was with her. We have to understand the thought and the context of, this trans, of the translation of that. He was there. He was there when she ate of it. He saw what was about to happen. He had the ability and he had the power to save her life. He could have saved her from this death that she was about to step into. He could have kept her from touching it, taking it, eating it, and certainly not Accept it when she gave it, or eat it, much less, much less to eat it. Why didn't Adam? Why? Why didn't Adam ask her? Who told you you could eat that if he wasn't in the conversation, okay? What if he wasn't there when the devil told her all these things and deceived her? What, what if he was not there? Why wouldn't he say, who told you that you could eat from the tree? You know the command. We've been over this. God's been over this with us. We know that we can't eat this. Don't stop. What are you doing? Adam had knowledge and experience that Eve didn't even have. Adam was created before Eve. Who knows how long he lived before Eve was created. The Bible doesn't exactly say a whole lot about that. Genesis 2, 19-20, all creatures brought, were brought to Adam to be named. 
Bible says that God created all the creatures and then he brought them to wherever Adam was in the garden. He brought these creatures to him so that he could name the creatures. Don't you know a serpent is a creature? It is a beast. And he named that serpent. Serpent. And he knew a lot about that serpent. He had the ability. He had the power and the knowledge to be able to protect Eve. He had the power to do it. And the Bible says in Genesis 3, 7, that after they ate, that the eyes of both of them were open. It was only after Adam ate. It wasn't after Eve ate. It was after Adam ate. When they both had partaken, then, not just one of their eyes, it wasn't Eve's eyes opened when she ate, then Adam's eyes. It was when Adam ate, then both of their eyes were opened, and then they saw in a different way, with a guilty conscience. And they understood evil in an intimate way. They had become intimate with evil. They had become intimate with temptation and sin. They had tasted of it, and now they knew it in a way that they obviously would have never otherwise known it. What was non-magnetic had become magnetic. Their human flesh was non-magnetic to temptation. And then once they had tasted and they sinned, now every temptation that would ever follow after it would become extremely powerful. It would have a magnetic pull on them to be drawn into that sin. The pull of temptation was then created. It became magnetized. The temptation became magnetized by sin. Then they were moved from a non-magnetic region to a magnetic region. They were taken out of the garden where the tree of life was. The tree that they were supposed to be eating from the most. That was going to strengthen them. That was going to give them life like no other. Which to us is the cross. It's what Jesus did for us. Amen. Number five, the five, fifth thing that we need to know while enduring a struggle. We need to know the difference between what's very good and what's very forbidden. When you know the difference and know it well, it won't matter how the devil operates. John chapter 8, verse 32, Jesus says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. That is one of, probably not as much as John 3, 16, but that is certainly one of the very most quoted scriptures. But what is this truth in the context that Jesus said that? In John chapter 8, same chapter, verse 28, he's talking about, he's talking to the disciples, he's talking to the Jews, he's telling them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. I am the Son of God. That conversation, he was talking about how he was sent from above. And that he was from above, and that all man is from down below, from the dust, from the dirt. Before a soul ever became, came into being, you were just nothing but a thought in God's mind. And he was explaining to them the cross. When you've lifted up the Son of Man, every time he talks about being lifted up, I believe there's about three times in the Gospels, it's actually all in John, in John, where he talks about the Son of Man being lifted up. The Son of Man being lifted up. It was a reference to the cross. It was a reference to the manner in which He would die. But notice what happens. After He dies on the cross, then what happens? You will know. <laughs> he says, you will know. There is so much revelation that will come to us through the power of the cross. Amen. That is why, as you first receive Christ at the cross, you are to walk in Amen. Him at yes. the cross. That's where the revelation comes. I'm going to tell you what, where revelation started to come to me like I had never experienced before in my Christian life was when I got a hold of that. It was all in Romans for me. It was all in Romans. I went back to the teachings that were taught in the Bible study before this church was even started. I've got a, a good recommendation. You could go to the Crossology YouTube channel. You can go and you can type search for Romans and just find all the messages on Romans. And if you want victory in your life and you want to truly understand it, if you're struggling and you don't know how to get over on top and you don't know how to get above it, 
but it's always on top of you and you feel like you're drowning. I'm going to tell you that revelation of what he's talking about in Romans, what Paul is teaching us, and what has been brought down to us through this church, it is what gives us what we need. It's everything. So in context, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. It all goes back to the cross. Amen. I'm not taking it out of context. That's right. And I said in another message that God's not obligated to stand behind a, a sermon that's preached out of context. Amen. His spirit's not going to get behind it. But the fact here is that when Jesus was lifted up and he died on the cross, then their eyes were opened. Then they knew he's the son of God. He was sent from heaven. He is the Christ, the anointed one. He's Amen. the Messiah that all the prophets were talking That's about. Right. He's the one that David and Hosea That's and right. Zechariah and Isaiah, they were all talking about him. He's Amen. the one, Habakkuk. Amen. He's the one. Amen. It's him. Thank you, Jesus. He was supposed to die. It didn't make any sense at the time, but David even described it. Right. It was all right there. They just didn't see, and their eyes needed to be open. But the only, there was one significant thing that had to happen for their eyes to be open. And whatever you're going through, whatever your struggle, your thorn is, there's something that has to happen inside of us. We have to make a connection with that cross. We have to make a connection with that tree of life. Amen. And when we make that connection with the tree of life, we make that connection. Then our eyes are open and we start to see the thorns and we start to see the struggles and we start to see the irritations. It could be the spouse, like I mentioned earlier. It could be the children. It could be the sister, the brother. We start to see them in a very different way. Amen. Genesis 1.31, it says, And God saw everything. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. God made the world perfect. There, people ask this question so much. You know, this question that I'm about to tell you, it came to me on my current job as a storekeeper, and I'm very blessed. I, live, I work in an area where I'm by myself. So if I can't get along with everyone in there, I am the problem. <laughs> and so when people walk in, it's my, it's, it's my area. You know what I'm saying? I can create the environment. I can create the atmosphere. And it's a beautiful thing. It really is. Because I'm in unity with God. I can tell you that. And at least I try my best to be. And people don't understand. And, and I, for the longest time, I really didn't have any answers. And I still don't know that I have the the very best answer. But why does God allow pain? This is the one thing that we do not need to know. This is the one thing we don't need to know. Why does God allow pain, suffering, and premature death? We're asking the wrong question. What, God, am I to do with all this pain, with this suffering, and this premature death, the evil. Why does God allow it? Why? The fact of the matter is, when it all started, and we already read it at the beginning of the message, Genesis 1.31, when God created everything, He looked at it. He stepped back, so to speak. And He saw it, and He's like, man, this is very good. What I have done is perfect because if God wanted to, He could praise Himself if He wanted to. And it would be very good. It would be perfectly fine. It would be justified. Everything that God does is perfect. And because of what Adam and Eve did, it's no longer perfect. He allowed them. Why though? Why does God allow sin? Why does God allow temptation? Why does God allow evil? What kind of love would it be if he didn't have a choice to resist and to reject? It wouldn't be real love. It wouldn't be real faith. It wouldn't be real commitment. It would be a, a mechanical relationship. It would be a relationship that had no substance. There had to be something staked on it. That was the point that Satan was trying to make to God about Job. What is the point? It's all for naught. I can't get to him. Nothing's ever going to go wrong in Job's life. He's the most wealthiest man on the earth. He's got everything. He's got a lovely family. He has no needs. And then God said, you know what? Okay, fine. Not that it's going to matter. All right. Go ahead, but you can't kill him. And he allowed him. He allowed him to do his thing. So 
So back to the question. Why does God allow pain, suffering, and premature death and evil? Why did God make it that way? He didn't make it that way. He made it perfect. Amen. We are not just stuck with a world of evil forever. That's another point that I want to make. We're not just stuck. Okay, so now we're just stuck. We're stuck in this world. We're stuck in this earth with all this pain, all this suffering, and all this evil. No. Revelation 12, 3 through 4. Revelation 12, 3 through 4 says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, no more grief, no more mourning. There will be no more crying, no more painful outcries from the depths of people's hearts, from the hurts. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. There is coming a day when we're going to be with God, we're going to be in His presence, and we're going to look back at all that pain. We're going to look back at all that suffering. We're going to sense the feeling of what it used to be like, but it's not going to be the same feeling. It's not going to be the same. He will have already wiped it away. God's going to restore everything back to its own perfect order. God's going to bring it back to where it was in the beginning. It's going to happen. And that's the hope that we have. Mm -hmm. And so instead of asking the question why, we need to be asking what, what is it that I can do for you, God, concerning all of this? Because people are hurting. People are dying. Well, I didn't actually get into the story about my workplace and in my area. There was a guy that walked in. I'm sure y'all have noticed I hand out cards. I give these out to everybody. I give them to sinners. I give them to people that don't know the Lord. I give them to people that do know the Lord. I write them in such a way that it could hit almost anybody, some of them. And the, what led me to doing this, what led me to this is I was doing Bible studies offshore. And I even shared a little bit about that in one of my messages here. But it took a turn for what I was considering the worst, but it really wasn't for the worst. It got to a point to where people were uninterested and they really didn't want to go. And I was saying, why, God, why, you know? And he showed me that, you know, this was actually a good thing. It's okay. It's, it's okay. Just chill out and calm down, all right? And that's when he gave me this idea. And I started handing these out. And I actually got so much more of the word out doing this. And it opened up so much more conversation with people by doing this than it did anything else. But it's all about just getting the gospel out there and helping people that are already in Christ help them to understand how to get victory. Because I'm going to tell you what, God has given me victory. He is definitely doing something in my heart. And so this guy walks into the warehouse. And the first thought that came into my mind was I asked him this question. And I asked him, I said, I said, so and so, are you a God-fearing man? He said, stop. He said, man, I cannot believe you just asked me that. He said, are you kidding me? He said, man, I have been wanting to come talk to you about this very topic. Mm -hmm. He said, man, I don't know what I believe. He said, I, what do you call it, atheist or agnostic? I guess I'm an agnostic. I said, yeah, I guess you are. I said, why? He said, man, I just don't understand how could God allow all this pain and all this suffering in the world, all the evil, man. What is up with that? Why? And he starts to, to share what's going on in his personal life. I said, man, we need to get together and we need to talk. I said, before you go, let me give you a card. And so he left and, and we got together a few days later. He came to the room and, and I started to talk to him like this. You know, God created everything perfect. And people want to know why is all the evil and how did it get so bad? And I told him about Adam and Eve. And I told him about the scripture in the book of Revelation. I shared that same scripture with him. How in the end, God's going to restore everything. And, and there was a story or an analogy. And I told him, I said, man, I said, look, this is not the perfect analogy. But this is the best I can do for you right now. And I'm going to tell you what, when, when God takes over, when God takes control, he knows exactly. He knows exactly what needs to be spoken. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened that day. I can tell you it had absolutely nothing to do with me because I started to tell him, I said, look, man, I said, look, it's kind of like, uh, you know, uh, you know, I have a child and, and, and your parents, or I, I use the analogy of my parents and his parents. 
Before they decided to have children, they knew there was a possibility that when they had children, those children would grow up. They could, for whatever reason, begin to hate us, hate them turn their back on them and walk away from them and just cut off the relationship and never have a relationship with them again. And I said the same potential for a bad relationship to come from it is there for a loving, strong relationship. And because of the potential for a good, strong relationship, my parents made a decision. They said, no, we're going to have kids. And your parents said, no, we're going to have kids. And I said, but it doesn't change the fact that it gave them a choice and you have a choice. And he stopped me right there and he said, Aaron, I cannot believe you just told me that story. He said, you have no idea. He said, man, I have so much pressure on me right now. He said, I'm trying to be there for my fiance. I'm trying. It, it's hard, man. I'm out here. I want to be home. I feel like I need to be home. I need this job. I need the money. I'm stressed. I don't know what to think. This last time home... I told my mom and dad, I don't want to have nothing to do with you. Wow. I'm cutting you off. Wow. I am not talking to you ever again. Wow. He said, man. He said, what do I need to do? Wow. What do I need to do? I said, you got to be born again. He said, okay. But what do I need to do? Do You know, tell me. Let's do it. And so I explained to him what being born again is. And he asked again, what do I need to do? And I said, well, but you've got to understand Romans 10, 9, and 10, that you have to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. That's what you have to do to become born again. But I said, if you don't really believe it, it doesn't matter what you say. Right. It doesn't matter what comes out of your mouth. And before you walk away today, it needs to not matter what happens when you walk away. You have made a decision. <coughs> and so we prayed that day and he received the Lord. Amen. And I'm going to tell you what, that to me was one of the most fearful questions that I have ever had to face. And I've faced it before. That wasn't the first time to answer that question. Why? Why does God allow all this? But there was a significant, significant change that had taken place in my life before that conversation. There's another thing that we need to understand about sin and what happened that day that Adam and Eve fell in the garden. Sin has disrupted creation's divine order. Since Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the garden, there's been hurricanes, there's been typhoons, tornadoes, earthquakes, tsunamis, all kinds of things completely and totally out of the order of nature and the way that God created it. How do I know that that's against God's nature? I know for a fact because when he created everything, it was very good. And there is nothing very good about any of that. Look at Joseph. Joseph said in Genesis 50, 20, what you thought for evil against me, God has meant for good. He told his brothers that what you thought <coughs> For evil against me, God meant it for good to save many people. Pain, this is the real point, I think. Pain is God's servant. God wields pain and uses pain for his own purposes. God doesn't cause pain. God doesn't send pain. God allows pain. Because Satan had to get permission before he could do anything to Job. Satan had to get permission before he could do anything to Peter and the rest of the disciples. Satan had to get permission to do what he did to Judas. But Judas had already committed himself over to Satan. We can't forget the will. Judas made his choice. Peter and the other disciples made theirs. God will allow people, pain, and other instruments of struggle to break us down and humble us before him. As Paul said, Lest I should be exalted above measure. The measure he is talking about is when we raise up over the place that only belongs to Jesus. Mm -hmm. We have the capacity to raise ourselves and lift ourselves up in pride. And put ourselves in the place that only Jesus should have. In our weakness, we have the option to do something different. We can lower ourselves under. Amen. Under the mighty hand of God and give Jesus, who is the Alpha and Omega, give him the first place. 
Give him a place, the only place, the first place. And you can be sure that he will lift you up, according to James 14. Because he loves us, that's why. You want a good answer to the question that I don't, I can't say it's the best answer. I can tell you that the reason that these things are allowed is because God loves us. If he doesn't allow the pain, what is going to get our attention when we're away from him? If, we, if he does not allow things like that to happen. I like 2 Corinthians 4.18. It says, while we, look at not, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And that's what we have to remember when we're going through the struggle, the thorn, the pain, the evil, the deaths. When we're going through that, we have to remember that it's temporal. If this was the only life, it would be life shattering. If this was the only life, it would be the end. It would be worth taking that approach. Praise God, it's but it's not. Amen. Praise God. It's not. Because we know that this is not all there is. Amen. This is not it. And that's what I had to tell my co-worker that day. That was another thing that I had to get him to understand. Look, you're looking at things in the temporal. you got to look at things in the eternal. This is God trying to get your attention. This is God trying... I don't know that God tries. This is God getting your fiance's attention. This could very well be God getting her mother's attention. He loves y'all. He loves all of you. This is the first installment, this life. This is the first installment of the rest of your life. Your best life certainly is not now. Amen. But your most critical life is now. Amen. The rest of your eternity hinges on your most critical life, which is now. Hebrews 12, 2. Let's look at Jesus. He persevered. He endured. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Look at what he endured. Look at his thorn. Can you even call that just a measly struggle? What he endured strengthens us to endure. Check that out. What Jesus endured is what strengthens us to endure. He is the greatest example of patient endurance in the face of the most powerful temptation to quit. One thing that we need to be resolved of is that no matter what it is that you're facing, you can't quit. You just can't. You can't afford to. You don't have enough money. To pay for what Jesus did. That right there is where it's at. In your surrender to him. Understand that his will. Is to establish complete dependence on him. Which is the best possible condition. A man or woman could be in. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. That would bring you to that place. But to be. In complete dependence. On Christ. Is the best possible condition that a man or woman could be in. Would you please stand with me? His strength will not coexist with yours. He wants you depending on His strength alone. When that which you have hoped for is delayed, it might make your heart sick. But when the desire is fulfilled, it is like a tree of life. Proverbs 13, 12 says that. You can boast in the strong arm of the Lord because while you are patiently waiting, he is strengthening you. His grace is sufficient for you. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And so I want to get back to, I want to get back to the theme scripture in closing. That's what he said. My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. And most gladly, therefore, he says, I will glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest on me. I know it may seem like a cliche, but it's not. <clears throat> to thank God for the struggle. More than a cliche, it almost seems absurd. But to thank God for the weaknesses that we have. To thank God for the thorn, for whatever it is. Maybe it isn't here yet. 
Maybe you're saying, you know what, right now at this time in my life, there is nothing like that at the moment. I'm telling you. There is no doubt about it. If it hasn't already happened, and maybe it has, most likely there'll be something else that's going to come. And you're going to need to learn how to thank Him and how to just trust Him and be grateful and know that your weakness is where His strength comes in. That's the whole purpose. That's the whole purpose of it. It's so that we can exchange our weakness for His strength to make us where we can triumph over.